What's up everyone? My name is Peter and I'm the Dungeon Doctor. This is session two of my Monk Masterclass series, where I'll be presenting optimized builds for every single Monk subclass in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. In this video, we're going to take a look at how we can optimize the way of four elements, Monk. I'll be giving an overview of the subclass, looking at both its strengths and its weaknesses. And at the end of the video, I'll be presenting the first of two optimized builds that use the subclass. The first of these builds will be the Way of the Avatar. Really excited to show you this build, let's get right to it. Before we look at our build, let's ask ourselves, why do we want to play the Way of Four Elements Monk? Like the Sun Soul Monk, this subclass is very, very inspired by a popular anime, in this case, Avatar The Last Airbender. All of the features of this class give it abilities which are themed around the four elements that feature prominently within that show, these being water, earth, fire, and air. In addition to this, within the show, these elements are actually conjured through the use of martial arts styles. Because of this, it's not hard to see how the monk class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition it really is a good basis for creating a way of four elements monk. And when we throw in these elemental disciplines into the naturally martial arts orientated class, it should be easy to create a class that really brings to life the characters from this anime. However, just like with the Sun Soul Monk, we find that something goes a little bit awry when we try to translate something from a TV show to Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. To see why this happens, let's take a look at the subclass features. At third level, we gain our one and only subclass feature, Elemental Disciplines. What Elemental Disciplines allows our monk to do is acquire new element-themed abilities as they progress in levels. At third level, they get two Elemental Disciplines. One of them is always known, that's Elemental Attunement, and then they get to pick from one of a few that are available at third level. When they progress to higher levels, like sixth level, they're able to pick new elemental disciplines as well as swap out previous ones. When they progress then also to level 11 and level 17, the same happens again. And as this monk progresses to higher and higher levels, new and more powerful abilities become available to them. So with that being said, let's look at what becomes available at each of those levels. A third level, we gain elemental attunement. This is very much like prestidigitation and thaumaturgy, except it's got a much more elemental theme to it. It lets us do things like light or put out flames. It lets us chill or warm up food, make pictures and depictions in the elements of water, earth, fire, and air, or at least mist, as it's described. And so it's a really fun uh, utility kind of cantrip for us to have. It doesn't cost anything to use. And it's a nice bit of flavor for this character, but on its own, it's not adding a huge amount to the character. In addition to elemental attunement though, a third level we can pick one other elemental discipline. Because we're going to have this elemental discipline from third up till sixth level, it's really important that we get our choice of elemental discipline right when we pick up this subclass. So we're gonna pay special attention to these abilities that you can gain, and try and work out what's going to be the best for a potential character. The elemental disciplines that we can pick up can be broadly split into spell-like effects and actual spells that our monk can learn. The spell-like effects include Fangs of the Fire Snake, Fist of Unbroken Air, Shape the Flowing River, and Water Whip. Meanwhile, we have three spells that we could choose instead. Thunder Wave, Gust of Wind, or burning hand. Let's look at the spell-like effects first. Fangs of the Fire Snake is an interesting one. For one key point, when we make an unarmed strike, we can instead increase our reach to 15 feet. In addition to this, all of the unarmed strikes that we do for the rest of our turn deal fire damage. Whenever we hit a creature using a fist that is empowered by fangs for the fire snake, we can expend one more key point to deal an extra 1d10 damage to the enemy. And this is also fire damage. It's a very expensive option, especially when you get this at level 3. However, 
I don't see many people talking about the fact that this is essentially giving the monk a smite-like ability. Um, I think there's some really interesting things that we could potentially do with this, particularly if we were going for a Nova build. But I think we're going to save that for the part two of our look at the way of four elements monk. We also gain access to Fist of Unbroken Air. This and Water Whip are very similar, so we're going to address both of these abilities at the same time. Both of these cost an action to use, and they each cost two key points, which is quite expensive. Both these spell-like effects have a range of 30 feet and require the enemy to make a saving throw. In the case of Fist of Unbroken Air, it's going to be a strength saving throw against our key saving throw DC, and in the case of Water Whip, it's a dexterity saving throw. With Fist of Unbroken Air, if the creature fails its saving throw, it is pushed back by 20 feet and knocked prone. Meanwhile, with Water Whip, the creature is pulled 25 feet towards us and is not knocked prone. In both cases, the creature takes 3d10 bludgeoning damage, or half if they succeed on the save. And if we spend additional key when we cause the spell-like effect, it'll deal an extra d10 bludgeoning damage. Because this is a spell-like effect and not a true spell, we can do some things that we won't normally be able to, like combine this with a bonus action spell on our turn. In addition to this, it's not prone to anything like counter spell, so we are free to use this no matter what enemies we might be facing. There's also no size limitation to this effect, so we could push or pull anything from a small sprite to a Tarrasque with this effect, provided that they fail the saving throw. I think of the two options, Fist of Unbroken Air is probably the more universally useful feature. It has the additional benefit that it knocks creature prone, which is going to be really great for any characters who are going to get into melee with it. And pushing enemies away from you is generally more helpful than pulling them towards you, because most enemies have stronger melee attacks or sometimes no ranged attack option at all. So it really helps us keep enemies a distance and lets us deal with them while they're over there before they can become more of a threat to us. Water Whip, meanwhile, it can be quite useful to bring enemies who are maybe either trying to get away or prefer to be at range. However, these tend to be less common, so I would generally opt for Fist of Unbroken Air of those two. The really great thing about Fist of Unbroken Air, though, is how potent it is against flying creatures. Because it imposes the prone condition on a flying creature, unless it's flying using magic or has a hover speed, then when we knock it prone, it's going to fall from the sky down to the earth. And because we've got a reach of up to 30 feet with a spell-like effect, they could potentially take up to 3d6 falling damage when they do fall in this way. This then brings them much closer to our melee fighters and it's very helpful to the whole party. In addition to this, because we're pushing a creature away, if we're below them, we can add an extra 2d6 fall damage because they have been pushed up a further 20 feet before they fall. So, really great use case for this. In both the case of Water Whip and Fist of Unbroken Air, they combine really well with Stunning Strike. For those who don't know, the stunned condition makes creatures automatically fail their dexterity or their strength saving throws. So if we've managed to stun a creature before we use either of these effects, then we're guaranteeing that they're going to be useful on our next turn. The last spell-like effect available to us is Shape the Flowing River. This is the cheapest option that's available, only costing one key point. I think it's got some really useful utility. If we're in a seafaring campaign or an Arctic campaign like Rime of the Frost Maiden, then Shape the Flowing River can be really great for creating uh, bridges over water. It can be useful for creating cover when we're out exploring in the icy wilds. It's a great problem solving tool. However, unless we're in one of those two settings, I think it's really hard to justify taking this feature because it is very circumstantial in how we'd get the most benefit out of it. So let's look at the spells that are also available to us. We have Burning Hands and Thunderwave. They offer similar advantages, both 
provide area of effect damage with burning hands causing a little bit more damage and requiring a dexterity saving throw whereas thunder wave doesn't do quite as much damage and requires a constitution saving throw however with thunder wave it does have that useful knockback ability which can be circumstantially useful the other spell available to us is gust of wind now, Burning Hands and Thunder Wave both cost two key points and are first level spells. Meanwhile, Gust of Wind is a second level spell and still only costs two key points. You'd think this might be getting us a bit more for our key than we would otherwise. And admittedly, Gust of Wind is a concentration spell, so we can keep this effect going for potentially a few rounds. However, I think unless we've got a particular effect that we want to push creatures into, then it's hard to really use Gust of Wind. Depending on our party that we're joining, it could be very useful, however. When we reach level 6, we can choose one more elemental discipline, and we can trade out one of our earlier elemental disciplines for a new one. Um, at level 6, we actually gain access to two more spells that we can choose. These are Shatter and Hold Person. In both cases, they cost three key points. And of the two, I think Shatter is probably the more generally useful. I think it's always useful to have a few characters able to do air of effect damage so you can blast a lot of weaker enemies all at once. Meanwhile, on a monk, I find it hard to justify taking Hold Person. With monks, by the time you're at sixth level, you've already got access to Stunning Strike. And so you have an effect which can nearly paralyze creature. Paralyzed condition adds the additional benefit that attacks that do hit automatically get critical hits. Meanwhile, stunned doesn't have the additional benefit. However, I think the best benefit that both give is taking that creature's turn away from them. So really, there's not a lot in it between them. With Hold Person, you do, are able to cast it at range. However, with Stunning Strike, you are able to use it with just spending one key point when you get a hit, and you could potentially subject the same creature to the Stunning Strike effect multiple times in the same turn. So you can try to make them make the saving throw several times at once. This is probably better than Hold Person, which does focus on a generally weaker saving throw, Wisdom. However, it is then also limited to just affecting humanoids as well. So I think in general, most of the time you're going to get more benefit out of hitting a creature with Stunning Strike three times than using Hold Person once. The one other advantage to Hold Person is that the creature that fails the saving throw is paralyzed until they can shake that effect. So they can potentially have to make the saving throw multiple times at least until your concentration fails um the other thing is it does upcast pretty well for our monk as just one additional key point does upcast at an additional level so we could potentially be affecting multiple humanoids at once however it's still very circumstantial compared with stunning strike so it's definitely not my first pick when we reach 11th level, we can pick up another elemental discipline and trade out an earlier one, and we gain access to three more options. These are in the form of the spells Fly, Fireball, and Gaseous Form. I think of the options, Fireball is always useful. Again, for the same reasons as Shatter, it's a very large area blast, useful for when we're dealing with lots of low-level enemies. And while it's late into the game to be getting this, I think it's always going to be a useful option to us. Meanwhile, fly, I think, is especially good on a monk. This is because the fly speed we get from this spell, which is 60 feet, is added to our unarmored movement, which, when we gain access to this, could be as high as an additional 15 feet. And so we have this very fast fly speed when we do gain this effect which could potentially make us faster than a lot of flying enemies. The last option is Gaseous Form. I think this one's a bit more circumstantial, but if we are in a party where we're lacking a good infiltrator option, such as a rogue or maybe a druid with wild shape, 
then I think this is a pretty good option as it can really help us get in and out of uh, difficult to access areas very easily and reliably. Lastly, when we reach level 17, we gain one last elemental discipline. We can trade out an earlier one and we gain access to four more potential spells. These spells are Wall of Fire, Wall of Stone, Cone of Cold and Stone Skin. In the case of Wall of Fire and Stone Skin, they only cost five key points. Meanwhile, Wall of Stone and Cone of Cold both cost six key points. These are all really great spells. However, this is at quite a high level to gain them. I think of the options, Wall of Stone is probably the most potent as it's very good for trapping enemies or creating walls which are very difficult to get past. However, I think there's some good cases to be made for Cone of Code and Wall of Fire as well. Stone Skin may be less so because that does rely on concentration and when we're hit, we can still drop concentration pretty quickly. The issue with all the subclass features that we get from Way of Four Elements Monk is that they require key. This means as soon as we've expended all our key, it can feel like this monk is lacking any kind of subclass. And so that's why it tends to get rated pretty poorly. However, I think we can maybe think of this monk in a similar way to how warlocks are very short on resources as well. They, up until very high levels, only have two spell slots that they can draw on, and they recover all of these spell slots when they do get that short rest. I think, though, when we're building for the Way of Four Elements monk, we should really treat the use of these elemental disciplines as a very precious and finite resource that we use when the situation really calls for it. And so when we look at multi-classing options for this particular subclass, we really want to pick features that help us really get the most out of the spells or spell-like effects that we've chosen. I would also say that the spell-like effects tend to offer a lot more in the way of how we can optimize this monk. This is because the spells could potentially be picked up from any class and used in the same way as you would as a normal spellcaster. Meanwhile, the spell-like effects are more open for interesting combinations and provide unique benefits. This concludes our overview of the subclass. However, let's get straight into the first build we'll be discussing for it, the Way of the Avatar. This build attempts to take the features that are available to the Way of Four Elements monk and really create scenarios where it's very useful to have these features. This build will focus very heavily on Wisdom, and so they'll have a very good stunning strike that they can use, and they will also have a lot of great control effects that they can draw on. And so really, if you want a kind of avatar-based controller-like build, I think this is a really excellent option for you. Okay, let's start with race options. For this build, we don't require any particular feats to make it work. Because of this, we can choose anything from Harangon to Variant Human, Custom Lineage, any of the creatures available in Modern Canaan's Monsters of the Multiverse are really great because they allow you to pick up a plus one in three different ability scores. And actually with this particular build, it is very helpful for us to be able to maximize our dexterity, wisdom, and constitution. So I think You'd be forgiven with this build for really going for that full moon maxed monk of a 16 in wisdom, dexterity, and constitution, while having an 8 in intelligence, charisma, and strength. However, I will say if you don't like the idea of just min maxing a character, you could probably afford a slightly lower dexterity on this, as we will be investing hard in ways to use our wisdom scores, so there are some flexibilities on our ability scores that way. I'd say though, whichever race we do go, let's pick something that's a medium-sized creature. We'll get into why that would be useful a bit later. If we do choose to go variant human, I would say probably pick up the resilient constitution feat, Again, this allows us to have a plus one in three different ability scores, one of which is constitution, when we pick this race. And we will be 
concentrating on spell effect. So it is a very useful feat for us to pick up as we won't be getting constitution saving throws from any of the classes we're getting. For our background and skill choices, I don't think there's anything that we specifically need. However, for flavor, I would definitely pick up something like animal handling. We will also have a very high wisdom. So picking up something like perception and being the party member who tends to notice the most things can be pretty helpful. At level one, we'll be picking up a level in monk. Like all benders of the elements, we'll be starting our training with just learning martial arts. We won't be having any special abilities from this level. We'll just be focusing on the basics and we'll pick up features like martial arts. We'll have unarmored defense, which because we have a plus three in wisdom and dexterity means we start off with an armor class of 16, which is respectable. As for our other abilities course, uh, intelligence, charisma, and maybe strength, I like to think that this monk is maybe, I don't know, for reasons got limited knowledge of world history and current social conventions. It's almost like they've been frozen in an iceberg for a hundred years or something of that nature. For our starting equipment, I don't think there's much we need to worry about here. However, we should pick up a quarter staff. This will both give us a D8 weapon that we can use, and it's going to be useful with some of the features that we pick up later. At level two, we're going to pick up our first of the four elements, water. However, um, there's not a lot of water up here, so I guess I'm going to have to go find some. One moment. Um, hmm. Okay, instant transmission isn't working anymore. I guess I'm going to have to walk. See you in a few weeks, I guess. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay, we're in the swamps now, apparently. Um, I've just talked to some druids. They've taught me water bending. It was great. A level two, we take a level in druid and... As an avatar in training, we've been getting uh, more in touch with nature, and now we're able to draw on its power a little bit more. Um, for our cantrips, we're going to pick up shillelagh. That means that we can use our wisdom now for making attack rolls, which will be more and more important as we get to higher levels. It also means that our quarterstaff, in addition to doing a d8 damage, that damage is now magical, which will be really great for if we're facing any creatures with resistance to non-magical damage. Also, for any characters who did want to sacrifice some of their dexterity for other scores, this is why I said it would be possible for us to have lower dexterity, because we won't be relying on our dexterity for those attack rows necessarily. So that's a useful way to go on if you didn't want to go for that full min-maxed character. Um, other cantrips we could go on, I think we're pretty flexible on, but Thorn Whip is really nice as well for a little bit of forced movement. Again, based on our wisdom score, um, I think a cantrip like Guidance would also be really nice as well. I'm calling on the experience of our ancestors to give us that little bit of help when we need it. Um, we could potentially pick some elemental spells like Produce Flame or Gust here, but I'd rather pick up those elements as we continue our journey as we level up. But most importantly, with Druid level 1, we can pick a few spells. I think the must-pick spell here is definitely Entangle. Um, it's a really potent concentration spell, and it's going to serve us really well as we level up. Um, it will restrain creatures who are in the area when we cast it or provided they fail a strength saving throw and it will also make that same area difficult terrain. The good thing as a monk with creating difficult terrain is that we will have advantages when operating in those conditions because we've got a higher movement speed we're able to use our additional movement to maybe get through terrain that monsters and other creatures won't be able to. We'll also see how the Entangle spell will really combine well with our choice of elemental disciplines later on. 
For other spells, though, I think it's hard to pass on absorb elements, as this really feeds into the idea of an avatar who's able to bend incoming elemental damage and then use it as part of their attack. Really great and thematic, as well as just generally useful. Um, other spells, I think Healing Word is great. Like in the show, waterbenders are able to use water magic to provide some healing. I think having that flavor here is great. Another great spell that druids have access to is Fairy Fire. A little bit harder to justify with the theming, but I think it's a great spell and worth thinking. And because we're a druid, we can change our prepared spells on a long rest. So you can mix and match as you feel, but I think Entangle is definitely the one that we need to have going forward. When we pick up Druid, we do gain access to some armor options. Now, this will depend on your table whether Druids are able to wear metal armors at all. So if you are able to wear metal armors, you could potentially get very high armor class. Um, even with just a 14 in dexterity, you could be getting a 19 armor class at this point. However, if you're not getting anything like that and you're just having access to maybe leather armors and a shield, I think it's probably best just sticking with our unarmored defense for our armor class, simply because we might only be trading out a single point of armor class for that additional movement. And I feel like this character is going to be much more about casting spells and effects from a distance rather than necessarily going straight into the melee, at least at low levels. However, I think it's worth keeping your armor in mind, especially if you acquire some special armors like Dragon Scale Mail, which druids are allowed to wear. So I think it's worth keeping stuff in mind. At level 3, we return to Monk and we develop our martial arts skills a bit more. This lets us pick up Key, giving us access to Flurry of Blows, Patient Defense, and Step of the Wind. And already we can see how the Druid subclass and the Monk start to synergize together. When we are in situations where enemies have rushed towards us, we have this option of being able to use Step of the Wind to get ourselves out of that area, and still have our action available to use the Entangle spell. This contrasts pretty heavily with how a wizard might respond to the situation, where as a bonus action for might be able to use Misty Step, but then they can't use a leveled spell with their actions. So we become a bit more versatile in being able to use the spells that we do have. So in situations where we aren't caught in the fray and can cast Entangle at a distance, with our bonus action we can then use that key point to either use the dash action to get ourselves far away from the combat and keep ourselves safe as well as our concentration, or if that is an option, as a bonus action we can use patient defense and that will put all attacks against us at disadvantage. With our 16 armor class we've got a fair chance at these levels of avoiding damage. A fourth level, we will be gaining our second element, air, which means we need to find some air nomads somewhere, which um, I think I'll go, go climb a mountain now. So um, yeah, this will be a few more weeks. Um, hopefully I'll have time to finish off this video. Um, see you once I get up there. Why the so many stairs? Okay. Um, I found the new civilization of air nomads. They've um, been very patient with me and taught me how to bend air now. And with that, we are going to take a, another level in monk. That makes us a monk three and a druid one. And we're going to be taking the subclass way of four elements. Whew. And with that, we get two elemental disciplines, the first of which is always elemental attunement. So we've already got this little bit of control over the four elements exhibiting in us. However, for the optional elemental discipline, the one that we get to choose, we are going to pick Fist of Unbroken Air. As I discussed in the overview, this is a really great option, especially when we're taking on flying creatures. And this is going to complement 
our druid level really, really well. With this firm broken air, when we're facing a flying creature, we can use this and potentially bring them out of the sky. And with Entangle, depending on the timing, we could potentially then bind them back to the ground, depending on how long they stay on the ground. We have the option with Fist of Unbroken Air of holding our action and waiting until a flying creature swoops down towards us. At that point, we could use Fist of Unbroken Air to potentially knock them prone. If they're using half their movement to then get up, there's a good chance they won't be able to move away on that turn. Because of this, we can then on our turn use Entangle to bind them to the ground and keep them there, taking away any advantages they get from flying. In addition to this, when we have cast Entangle, any creatures who break free of this and move out of the Entangled area, we can use Fist of Unbroken Air on to potentially push them 20 feet back, probably into the area of the Entangle spell, and when they're there, they're knocked prone. So now they have to use half their movement just to get up from prone, and then they have this difficult terrain that they need to move through to before they can get to anyone. And so with this combination, we've got a very effective means of really keeping enemies at a far distance and hopefully far away from us and our allies. I think with Fist of Unbroken Air, we really need one of these two scenarios to justify using it, or something else that's circumstantial, like we have a falling hazard that we think we could potentially knock an enemy into, or a area of effect spell that a, another caster has created, like Cloud of Daggers or a web spell that we can knock creatures into. These are quite common effects, and I think it won't be hard to find good scenarios for using Fist of Unbroken Air to get a really big impact. However, as just a simple blast spell, I think we're better off avoiding using it for that and maybe sticking to our martial arts when we want to use damage. I think if we want to do damage to creatures, we're probably better off sticking to using our martial arts abilities. So running in and using our should they lead quarter staff and then following up with either a martial arts attack or a flurry of blows attack. Alternatively, at this level, we've got uh, enough key points that we can pretty reliably use patient defense in a battle for one or two turns, and this should be more than enough to protect our concentration when we're in battles. A third level monk, we also gain deflect missiles, which means that we have got a few ways of protecting our concentration. If, for example, we're targeted by a ranged weapon attack, we're able to use deflect missiles to hopefully mitigate all of the damage it causes and then not need to make any concentration saves. A monk level 4, we've already mastered water and air. Now we're ready to master a third element. Fire! I can't go back down the mountain. I can't go back down all those stairs. <sighs> Thing just to jump off this place. All right, another few weeks, another season of the show. Um, I'll see you in the Fire Nation. Oh, it's really hot here. Okay, we're in Fire Nation. We're going to be reaching fifth level, and we're going to pick up another level of Druid. Yay! Uh, we have learned from the best firebenders that we know, and we have picked up the Circle of Wildfire subclass from Druid. This gives us two great features. Um, firstly, we gain additional spells from the spell list available to Circle of Wildfire. These include Burning Hands and Cure Wounds, which are some really nice spells for us to have really builds on that fire flavor and actually means we don't even need to pick up burning hands from something like way of four elements so that's pretty nice um it's useful to have that blasting option when the situation presents itself the second feature we gain from our subclass is a way to use our wild shape in this case it lets us summon a little fire spirit um, in the same way that Ang has a couple of animals following him around be it momo the flying lemur 
or upper the uh, the sky bison. In our case, I like to think we've got a little fire ferret, um, a bit like Pabu from um, it, the Legend of Korra series. And this little fire spirit has a lot of nice utility to it. Um, as a bonus action, we can summon it for one hour. Because Wild Shape uh, comes back on a short rest, we should be able to have a fire familiar with us for pretty much most settings. However, when we don't have it with us, it is still useful to summon it in combat. Because as an action, we can expend one use of our Wild Shape, and where it is summoned, a explosion of fire bursts out, and all creatures in that area need to uh, make a dexterity saving throw or take 2d6 fire damage. So that's pretty useful if we haven't already got summoned. However, I think its most useful features are what we can get our little fire spirit to do on a bonus action. When we have our fire spirit summoned, we can use a bonus action to command it to do one of two things on its turn, which follows our turn. These include making a ranged fire attack and having a small short range teleportation ability. The ranged fire attack is nice as a option when we aren't using our martial arts. I know with Tasha's optional features, when we use something like a key based action like Fist of Unbroken Air, we are able to use our bonus action to make an attack with a monk weapon, so we do still have that option. However, I think using our bonus action for this low ranged fire attack is probably going to be a bit more useful in general. The other use for the bonus action is fiery teleportation. On the familiar's turn, which will be on the turn immediately after ours, after our turn has ended, when we command it to use Fiery Teleportation, it will take itself and any creatures within 5 feet who want to come with it up to 15 foot away from that space. From the wording of the feature, it sounds like the creatures don't need to end their turn adjacent to the creature after it uses this Fiery Teleportation. So I think there's options for uh, moving, say, like a fighter who doesn't want to stay in that position and follow the familiar, but maybe wants to move to a different location. It's almost like a kind of short-range scatter-like effect, which I think is pretty useful. However, the reason why it's really useful on this character in particular, we are going to be focusing a lot on effects like Entangle. Now, Entangle does have a problem with friendly fire. If our allies fail the saving throw against Entangle, on the same turn that we cast the spell, we can use a bonus action to command our fire spirit to teleport them out of the area of entanglement. I think this makes entangle a really versatile spell, and because we've covered the other shortcoming, where it can't target flying creatures using our monk abilities, it makes it really the core spell that we'll be casting most of the time. And now that we're Druid 2, we can cast up to three times a day, so it's really useful on this build. In addition, when our Fire Spirit does use Fiery Teleportation, it will deal fire damage to a creature that was within five feet of them that's remaining there. And so if that creature is restrained, they're going to have disadvantage on the saving throw against that fire damage. So we get just a little bit of extra damage equal to 1d6 plus our proficiency bonus if they do fail it. So that's really nice. Lastly, the reason why I really wanted a medium-sized creature for our race is because I think it makes a lot of sense to have our fiery spirit on our shoulder or on our back when we're in combat. This is because it ensures it's always within five foot of us when we use the fiery teleportation so we can have the benefits of that and move around a bit more freely. I think it also makes things a lot simpler for the DM as well, as they don't need to track an additional creature on the battle map, which I think they will thank you for, to be honest. Um, and also, that fire spirit will be benefiting from our additional movement if it's essentially treating us as a mount. And so, while the fire spirit has a flying speed, I think, of 30 feet, we've got a potentially higher movement speed of 40 feet, and that will increase as we get to higher levels, which means that we can 
deliver us and our fire spirit towards our allies for when we need that fiery teleportation a lot better. But there's also nothing to say that the fire spirit can't dismount from us and move across to an ally at some point as well. So I think it's really versatile just to have it mounted on us and then in some cases have it dismount to go to someone that we can't get to. I think many eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that we're at level 5 but we haven't gained features such as extra attack or stunning strike with this character and honestly I think this is a character that doesn't necessarily need to race towards those features. We've got a lot of great control effects with Entangle and in terms of our action we are generally using something more important with our action such as Tangle or Fist of Unbroken Air or something like that. We've also got a bonus action attack with either our Martial Arts, Flurry of Blows or our Fire Spirit that we can use. So we're never really short on attacks either. And so I think it's okay to sacrifice that extra attack for uh, being able to pick up all these features pretty early. At this point, I think it's easy to see how we've started to build up this character. So we're both combining uh, these druid elemental spells and elemental effects like the fire spirit with our martial arts, where we're able to use our martial arts to either dash or disengage or even use patient defense to try and protect our concentration better. And I think overall, we're getting a really nice mix of Elemental abilities with martial arts, which I think players are really looking for in this class. But we've got one more elemental to get, which means um, I'm going to have to go for a walk again. This is going to be our last element. We're going to the Earth Kingdom to learn how to earthbend. So I will see you outside Ba Sing Se. Oh, that wasn't so bad. Nice man over there, just give me a cup of tea. So, uh, finally, at level six, our avatar training is complete. We've acquired the elements of water, air, fire, and earth. And to get earth, we're going to pick up another level in Druid. This is going to give us Druid 3, which gives us access to Druid's second level spells. And we are here for one spell in particular, and that is Spike Growth. Uh, for those who don't know, Spike Growth creates a 20-foot radius area of difficult terrain, where anyone crossing that terrain takes 2d4 piercing damage for every 5 foot of movement they go through it. It has a range of 150 feet and it lasts for 10 minutes and it's a concentration spell. I picture this a lot like a character is stomping the ground and then making all the rocks kind of churn up and become jagged and make it very difficult for creatures to pass through without getting hurt. And for our character, it's very much like an entangle spell. Something I forgot to mention with the entangle spell in terms of flavour. I think that flavour is free with this, and while being able to twist vines around might be might not be people's first thought when it comes to water bending, there was an option where instead of having vines grasping and pulling people to the ground, we could have instead have reflavored it as maybe some icy terrain that we create where with a blast of icy magic, um, we uh, freeze and restrain people in that way. So we didn't necessarily have to go down this swamp water druid uh, theme, but you know, following the flavour of the spell itself, I think it works well enough. And while I don't think this spell particularly mentions uh, earth as a component of the spell, I think spike growth is a very earthy spell in terms of the effects that we're getting. So, Spike Growth. It's very much an upgrade to Entangle, although I think both are very useful effects. Spike Growth gives us a lot of potential damage that we can deal against creatures who have to cross this terrain, whereas Entangle is good for when we're really looking at controlling that enemy.
The great thing about spike growth on this character, though, is that we are very versatile in how we can use it. Firstly, if enemies are next to us, we can use a bonus action disengage to move away from them before we cast spike growth. Alternatively, if it's not just us, but a lot of our allies are, are in this spike growth area, then we can use fiery teleportation to move ourselves and our allies out of that spike growth area to somewhere more beneficial that requires enemies cross that. So we've now got two tools in our arsenal for creating large areas that are really not great for our enemies, and we've got plenty of tools for making them still okay for our allies to exist within. So really good stuff. We could also arguably use fiery teleportation to teleport a creature into the spike growth area. And I think because they aren't moving across the area, because they aren't expending five foot of movement to move across it, we can actually pick up a fighter and place them in the spike growth area without it potentially damaging them. So that's really nice, actually. Um, similarly, our fire spirit can fly, so it doesn't need to touch the spike growth area. So really, really useful spell for us to have. Um, in addition to spike growth, um, I think spells like Heat Metal are a good call on this character. We also have access to Pass Without Trace, which I think is very good on this character and works with the flavor where we can literally earthbend to remove our footsteps and traces of our passage, which is nice. Um, from our subclass, we actually pick up Scorching Ray as well. Probably not my first choice of spell on this character as we're not really a blaster, but it's nice to have that option under our belt for when we do need to hit a lot of creatures at range. At level 6, we have all four elements under our belt, and this is very much the engine of our build. We're using spells to lock down the enemy, and then we're using our subclass features from Druid and Monk to keep that spell in effect and keep it useful to our allies. Now that we've got the engine built for this build, I think it's finally time to start refining it. And at last, at level 7, we're going to pick up Monk 4. And that's going to let us finally get an ability score increase, and we've been badly needing a plus 2 to our wisdom. That's going to improve all of our saving throws, it's going to improve our unarmored defense, it's going to make the damage that we can deal with a Shillelagh Quarterstaff better than what we can do if we've got a 16 dexterity, so that's nice as well. All really useful stuff on this build. Um, we also get Slowfall which is just a nice uh, ability for us to have. We aren't combining it with flight, at least not at this moment, so I think it's just nice, fairly circumstantial when it, we'd benefit from it, though. Level 8, we're then going to go back to Druid and also pick up uh, level 4, and we're going to pick up another ability score increase, such that between the last few levels, we've really amped up our... Uh, wisdom going from a 16 at level 6 to a 20 at level 8. And so our spell saving DCs have rapidly gone really, really good. Um, with level 4 druid, we get additional options for our wild shape. We can change into swimming creatures. I didn't talk much about wild shape earlier, but it's just a really good utility, uh, to have on us, that lets us infiltrate areas really well, that lets us explore really well. I think all the forms also benefit from our unarmored movement and our unarmored defense, so we've got some no benefits, even though we're only able to be these small or, you know, fairly inconsequential creatures. If we were to transform into something like an elk, we'd be adding our unarmored movement onto a creature that has a very fast movement speed, so I think there's a lot of good crossover with it, even though we aren't something like a moon druid. At level 9, we're finally going to reach that fifth level of monk, and that gives us access to stunning strike. And the great thing is that we, at level 9, have got a plus 4 proficiency bonus. We've also got a plus 5 wisdom modifier. That means our saving throw DC against stunning strike is a DC 17. 
which it feels really nice. At this point, we've uh, got the maximum possible DC we could have for our stunning strike. So when we gain access to the ability, it's going to be that much more effective and potent than if we had actually uh, gained it earlier in this class. Because we're using Shillelagh, we also have a pretty good chance to hit because it's based off our wisdom. And so we got a lot of good opportunities for stunning a creature. I think the way that we'd probably play with this character is to probably try and stun a creature early. That way we can then follow up on our second turn with some fairly low resource spells like Entangle that can just restrain the enemy straight away. This way, unless the creature can teleport on their turn, they will probably want to use their action to attempt to get themselves out of that restrained condition. And I think that's really good. That effectively gives us two rounds of stun, the second round being guaranteed once we've landed the first one. And I think it's a really good, efficient way of using both our resources as a druid and as a monk. And they just really complement each other, which I really like about this build. I really like how it feels like all of our druid features, our monk features, are just meshing really nicely together and becoming something that's greater than the sum of its parts. At level 10, I think we should take another level of druid. Let's get us to druid 5. There's a lot of great druid spells that you get from their third level spell list, such as Conjure Animals, which is always really strong and also always quite problematic, so use that with care. Um, I think we also get some really good control spells though, like Sleet Storm, which if we combine with effects like Fist of Unbroken Air, we have this great way of pushing creatures into very difficult terrain, difficult conditions, and really getting the most out of that spell and our Fist of Unbroken Air. So I think that's a great call. Um, and in addition to that, it just gives us more spell slots to work with for any of our Entangles, Spike Groves, possible healing effects as well. And so we're pretty versatile and with, I think, third level spells combined with our monk features, we should have enough resources to be pretty potent for all the combats that we face in a day. So because we've maxed out our wisdom pretty early, when we reach fifth level of druid, we're able to pick up to 10 spells on our spell list. And that's in addition to the six circle spells that we get. Um, I forgot to mention, one of the great circle spells we get at 5th level druid is Revivify. And that is so nice to have on a character. It suggests that we've really mastered our water bending for healing to the point that we're able to bring characters back from death at this point. And that's such a lovely thing to have on this character. It really feels like we're the master of all four elements at this point. At this point, though, I think we should probably go back to Monk for at least the next couple of levels. It's going to give us a lot more key to work with for fueling our spell-like effects. It's also going to give us more key for defending ourselves with effects like patient defense. And so we get to level six of Monk. We're able to pick a new elemental discipline and we're able to trade out elemental attunement for something. Uh, personally, I think I would trade out elemental attunement for shatter but i would not pick up hold person i would probably pick water whip as this gives us both a push and a pull effect and this complements each other because this gives us the option of wanting to move a creature through spike growth or through spike growth and i think that it's good to have both options on the table as they'll cover each other's bases really nicely there is a part of me that wants to go for Hold Person, and that's if only because we could claim to be almost doing bloodbending on creatures. For those who don't know, with a very powerful waterbenders, they're even able to bend the water inside of creatures. And I like this idea that Hold Person is a person just kind of freezing the blood inside someone, or at least holding it still and stopping them moving. And... That's very dark. Uh, I know that Hold Person is not a very effective choice of spell, but if you wanted that flavor, you've got it there. And lastly, for our level 12 campaign capstone, we're going to get another level of monk. This gives us 
more key. It also gives us evasion and stillness of mind. Just two nice defensive abilities that get, help us maintain our concentration that much more and help us be better protected for keeping those few key concentration spells up. This means that when we get to level 12, we've got a lot of great offensive abilities. We've got Stillness of Mind to shake off common Frightened and Charmed effects. We've got features like Evasion to avoid Dexterity saving throw damage entirely if we succeed on the save. We have got uh, abilities like Absorb Elements to minimize elemental damage coming in towards us. And we've got a pretty good unarmored defense. Uh, we've got a plus five wisdom and potentially a plus three dexterity, taking us to an 18 armor class, which if we use in addition to patient defense, does give us pretty good odds of dodging attacks. So for the overview of our build, from level one to six, our character very much went on this uh, traditional avatar's journey of gathering all four elements, training in all of them. And as they were training, they are really seeing this great synergy between their abilities as a martial artist and as a spellcaster, such that you're very easily combining both within any single round of combat. Meanwhile, from 7 to 12, it's almost like we're on this kind of spiritual journey where we're really increasing our wisdom and we're really getting that refined control over all of the four elements. And by the time we get to level 9, we've got Stunning Strike and are able to start doing stuff akin to almost like a chi blocking in creatures where we're able just to stun them by hitting pressure points and just really able to control enemies that much more better. I think that probably concludes this part of the build. So where do I see it going after level 12? I think it's tempting to carry on Monk right through up to level 20 on this now. Like in my previous build video for the Sun Soul Monk, this will give us Timeless Body as a kind of campaign, as a level 20 campaign capstone. It would also mean that we gain fly at 16th level as well as fireball at 16th level fly as mentioned before is really good as it adds to our unarmored movement meanwhile fireball i think i like mostly because the circle of wildfire druid isn't able to gain access to fireball and so we're kind of fixing that mistake that the subclass has if we keep going with monk we also gain proficiency with all our saving throws, which can really help out our constitution, but that doesn't come in until quite high level. So a potential thing would be to get resilient constitution at some point using an ability score increase. With our ability scores, we could potentially go for rogue, ranger, fighter, or cleric for our multi-classing. Ranger's pretty good if we want to improve our weapon attacks a bit more and gain certain low-level spells. However, I think with all those options, it, they kind of pale in comparison to carrying on with Druid and maybe taking that beyond level 5 and getting some of the higher level features. I won't talk too much about what you can get from Druid as you get to higher levels, but notably we could get the 14th level Circle of Wildfire feature, which allows us to essentially, when we fall to zero hit points, our Fire Spirit, our little... A little fire ferret, uh, Pabu, uh, just sacrifices themselves to bring us back to half our hit points. And I think that's a useful capstone to have, if a little bit grim, because I think that being able to be returned to half hit points when you're in that situation is really helpful for not adding more pressure onto other party members and getting you back in the fight very, very quickly. I think whether we take the path where we take our monk level as high as we can or we take our druid level as high as we can, we've got some really good options. I'd say the option where we take monk as high as we can feels a bit more in keeping with Avatar The Last Airbender as they do tend to be more martial arts focused and they don't tend to do very large high magic with their elemental spells. Meanwhile, I think if we went Druid, it is starting to get a bit more high magic, but I think both 
halves would be a blast if you were able to take this into very high level play. With that, that concludes the way of the Avatar. But what did you all think? Uh, have I, with this build, actually managed to save the four elements, Monk? Um, do you think there's anything you'd do differently? Do you think this would even be a fun build to play? Um, and also, I'd really love to know what subclasses people would like to see me cover next from the Monk class. I've got some in mind that I want to cover, but I'm willing to listen to the community and see what they're really keen to see. So please let me know in the comments below. And also, if you can give this video a like and give my channel a subscribe, that would be really helpful. As always, this is a new channel and every little bit you can do to help it grow means the world. But to maybe whet your appetites for next week, next week we're going to be continuing with the way of four elements and rather than try and get all four elements, we're going to be focusing on just one. Next week we're going for the explosive way of fire. I really can't wait to show you this build. It's very exciting and I think you're going to love it. All right, I look forward to seeing you all then. Cheers for hanging out with me and I'll see you all next week. A third level we gain our one and only subclass feature. How did I even get up here? Leaves from the vine Falling so slow Like fragile tiny shells Drifting in the foam